Ray, it used to be the fact that uh, humans and animals, there was a huge gap between them in terms of the intellectual understanding of the age. And then as science has developed in psychology and in biology, the gap seemed to, to become smaller. And indeed, what we thought were these uh, um, unbridgeable gaps, tool making or language, now is being challenged by different studies. Uh, you've been an advocate that there really is a significant gap between humans and animals, and I'd like to understand why. Simply because it's true. I mean, I'm able to see what's in front of my nose. And I think if you look at what's in front of your nose, you can see the total difference between the life of human beings like you and me, and the life even of our nearest primate kin. And you don't have to look to sort of high-end, high-voluting things to see this. You know, okay, chimpanzees don't fret over transfinite numbers, but in fact, <laughs> most human beings don't do that either. <laughs> you just got to look at ordinary, commonplace, everyday life, and you'll find the differences are absolutely wall to wall. If you look at feeding, learning, and so on, things that we do share with animals, mm. our engagement with these things is utterly and totally different. And you can see lots of surface differences, but they point to a more profound difference. And it's trying to, as it were, identify that profound difference, I would see as one of the most fundamental challenges of philosophy, of a philosophy that's concerned to see what kind of creatures we are, what kind of beings we are, and where we fit into the larger world. I think that's an unbelievably uh, important objective, but the argument is, is just the opposite, that the differences that we see are not representative of fundamental differences, but are actually very superficial, and when you get down, to, when you really start to analyze it, they disappear. So, for example, some of the, th the differences that, that w we see would be just, uh, would be a, 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 a sort of a cultural uh, accumulation, but no fundamental difference below. So what you're saying seems to be precise, recognizing the superficial difference. You're saying it points to a fundamental difference. Most scientists in the area would say, the more you study it, the, the, the differences disappear. So you're, you're saying exactly the opposite of what much of the scientific community uh, uh, stipulates. I'm not too sure that their opposite is delivered by their data. It seems to me that, of course, there is a fundamental similarity between myself and other mammals. I was born in rather similar way. They were born, much of my, many of my needs can be mapped to some extent on their needs. And of course, I face the same end as they do. So there is a story about me that is entirely biological. Mm -hmm. But actually, most of my days are filled with things that are quite a distance from biology, mm -hmm. even when it comes to rather homely things like eating. Yes, we stuff things in our stomata, just like <laughs> other beasts stuff things in their stomata. But the conditions under which we do so are utterly and totally different. Take the food on the table. First of all, I bought it by use of money, which I've earned some distant time from the mm -hmm. time when I'm eating the food. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as a chimpanzee reaching for a banana. Secondly, the conditions under which I eat are totally different. I eat according to the clock or according to rituals. My meals have a grammar built into them, as Levi Strauss pointed out. Mm. You know, we have first course, second course, third course. We meet for all sorts of social reasons. The food that reaches our table arrives at it by all sorts of complex means. A bread of loaf involves hundreds of people in producing mm -hmm. it, hundreds of technologies. I could go on, but I hope you can sort of catch my general drift. But uh, aren't these all derivative of just a, a concept of cultural accumulation? So you can, you can take all of these things and reduce them down to one fact, which if we then can explain as some sort of an accumulation fact that humans have because of language, I mean, there are a lot of different these kinds of theories, all of that would disappear. Accumulation is the key word. The accumulation started, who knows, perhaps five million years ago, and I can offer you a just-so story of how it all happened. Mm -hmm. But over five million years, you can get such an amount of accumulation that a difference in degree becomes a difference in kind. And I would argue that we now have a difference in kind, and probably have done for at least 300,000 years. Uh, the exemplification of this, uh, to me, is uh, the comparison between humans and animals, take, take dogs, and that uh, we uh, are, are quite uh, opposite in the, uh, in, in the basic necessities of life, in that animals, like dogs, will copulate and defecate in public, but eat in private. 
because they're worried that some other animal <laughs> might steal their food. And, and we humans are exactly the opposite. We eat in public, but copulate and defecate in private. Is, is, is that represent some of the things you're talking about? Well, uh, Louis Bunuel had a film which showed exactly that people were sitting around a table uh, defecating and then they <clears throat> coughed and then went off shamefully to the toilet to eat. So <laughs> you're precisely right. That indeed is the animal condition. And the reason that we copulate in private and we do other things in private is actually symbolic of the profoundly different relationship we have to our own bodies, to our sense of self, our being embodied subjects rather than mere organisms. Mm. And although it seems a minor thing, like a lot of these minor things, it points to something very profound. Something that didn't happen suddenly, but happened gradually. And I come back to your word accumulation. It's absolutely about accumulated differences that then lead to what must be regarded as a difference in kind rather than merely a difference in degree. So you're not postulating some uh, ethereal, mystical, theological, um, uh, ghostly um, thing that inhabits human beings to make a difference. Um, you're pointing out a, a fact that it is a difference in kind, not degree, which is extremely important, but um, somewhat agnostic about how that occurs, or you're saying that that is clearly the result of accumulation. Mm -hmm. My background is in science and in biological science, so you won't be surprised to discover I actually believe Darwin's theory of evolution. Yes. Uh, I'm a good Darwinian, so I'm going to have to find an explanation as to how we became so different. Mm. If there is such an explanation, and it would have to be a biological explanation of how we, as it were, became distanced from biology, then you can be a good Darwinian without suffering from what I call Darwinitis, which is an inflamed star <laughs> state of Darwinian theory in which you believe that everything about us can be ultimately or even immediately explained by those kind of imperatives that drove the evolutionary process. But if Darwinianism, in, in your est estimation, goes to Darwinitis, um, then there's something wrong with the da Darwinitis explanation for human differences, right? And so what, what is the alternative? You can imagine a story. I can offer you a story to show it can be done. Whether or not the story is true mm, right, is right. an empirical issue, and indeed whether it can be solved empirically is another matter. You can't run the tape twice, as mm -hmm. Stephen Jay Gould said, you know, to see whether a, a different set of a, a state of affairs or a different initial condition mm. would produce a different outcome. But essentially, you can have a story which begins perhaps five and a half million years ago, plenty of time to get big, big differences with our upright position, with the liberation of our quite different kinds of hands. Our hands are quite different in their capacities mm -hmm. from that of our nearest primate kin. The domination of the visual sense over other senses and so on. If you bring those things together, you can imagine a series of things happening that lead to a transformation of the consciousness of the animal in question. Suddenly, self-consciousness from being an episodic smidgen of self-awareness mm -hmm. becomes something continuous mm -hmm. and you become a self. And it's the embodied self, the embodied subject that human beings are that differentiates them from what are essentially organisms even in the higher primates.